The year was 2017, and while the Marvel Cinematic Universe was gearing up for a giant Avengers movie, another superhero team was about to form. Made up of a justice-obsessed vigilante who fights crime as a way to deal with a childhood loss, a super-strong warrior woman who could kind of fly, an impossibly cool, invulnerable muscle man, and a naive kid, they were finally going to team up. And yeah, not every character's individual solo story was a slam dunk, but there was promise, and this was the chance for this set of heroes to finally come together and show the world that they were on the Avengers level. I am, of course, talking about Marvel Netflix's The Defenders. I mean, you probably saw the title of this video, knew I wasn't talking about the Justice League, but still, solid bit. I'm willing to bet that you have not seen The Defenders, and even if you saw it, I have a feeling you've forgotten most of it. It came and went, this epic team-up show. It wasn't bad, but it left practically no impact. And like with Justice League, the missed opportunities killed me. Probably more, because I loved Daredevil and Jessica Jones. I liked Luke Cage. Iron Fist was also a show. I wanted Defenders to be great. And yet, it wasn't. So, like with Justice League, I got to thinking, what could they have done differently? Was there a version of this story that could have worked? A story that would bring together Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist in a satisfying and fun way? I think there is. But it would take way more than one small change. You would need one giant change that would create an entirely different series. So I would like to share that with you. My Defenders rewrite. However, I feel like I need to set the stage. To move forward, we first need to look backwards. So in this video, I'm going to lay the foundation for my rewrite, discuss some of the Defenders' biggest issues, and give you a sense for how I'm going to address those issues without going into specifics. And we'll end with the change itself, the big idea that I believe would have set the Defenders on the path to victory. So, if you'll indulge me, here is why I believe Marvel Netflix's Defenders did not work. Marvel Netflix's The Defenders was, at least for me, a huge, big bag of disappointment. I don't know anyone who watched it and considered it the slam dunk that the original Avengers was when it was released in 2012. And if you've seen the show, I don't need to explain why. Fight choreography was pretty uninteresting compared to Daredevil, which years before had set the high bar for TV action scenes. Action was also pretty difficult to see. The pacing felt uneven. And besides the issues Danny Rand brings to the series by just being the Danny Rand from Iron Fist, although to be fair to Defenders, at least in this series, characters we like get to take him down a peg and call him a thundering dumbass. That's a good move. But besides Danny, the clear biggest issue with the Defenders was the Hand. In case you're not familiar, the Hand was introduced in the back half of Season 2 of Daredevil. It is highly implied that Nobu, one of Kingpin's cohorts from Season 1 of Daredevil, was part of the Hand, although it wasn't confirmed until Season 2. It also turned out that Madame Gao from Season 1 of Daredevil was also a member of the Hand, even though the running theory through Daredevil Season 1 was that she was a character called Crane Mother, mostly because she really really seemed like she was Crane Mother. And then, in the first season of Iron Fist, we were introduced to more members of the Hand, besides confirmation that Gao was one of the leaders of the Hand, or as they are known, and I swear this is what they call themselves if you haven't seen the show, buckle up, the Fingers. We also met a character named Bakudo, who I absolutely hate, and not only was he leading a hand-sponsored recruitment center, whatever he was doing seemed to be at odds with Gao and her Hand activities since he kidnapped her. So right off the bat, problems. The hand and was a part of the worst two non-Diamondback aspects of Marvel Netflix Phase 1. They hadn't produced any extremely compelling characters or any fun fight scenes. And on top of that, they don't seem to have any consistent purpose. It just felt like whoever was writing any individual show at that time was able to decide what the hand was. Regardless of whether that lined up with the previously established hand, this all came to a head in The Defenders, where the hand was the sole antagonist. It was revealed that there were three other 
other fingers of the hand that didn't get along and kind of did their own thing. Besides Madame Gao, who was established as the magical leader of a New York City heroin enterprise, and Bakudo, the remarkably incompetent magical leader of a New York City sleepaway camp, there was also Murakami, whose entire character amounted to he speaks Japanese and he has a sword. So one day, an African warlord or something, who cares, and they were led by Alexandra, a rich lady who gave a couple of speeches and then spent all of the hand's black goo on resurrecting the character that a low-level hand boss was able to kill three shows ago. And oh yeah, the hand was after black goo that granted them temporary immortality. The goo was made of ground-up dragon bones that were, and I swear, this is the real plot of this show, the dragon bones were buried far underneath New York City, and if removed, New York City would collapse into an evil dragon-shaped sinkhole, I think. It wasn't necessarily unclear, but it was so nonsensical that my brain has trouble comprehending it, the same way I have trouble understanding the fourth dimension. Honestly, everything about the hand was disappointing, and people have talked about this before. Patrick Willems has a great video called Why is the Hand So Boring, where he goes through the comic history of the hand and relates that to why they don't work in the Netflix shows and Defenders specifically. So what can we learn from the hand? What were they lacking? And how can we address that with a new villain? Well, I think I've boiled that down to three things that I've assembled into a numbered list. We'll figure out what those are, and then we'll go forward and get a villain or villain group that can address all of those shortcomings. Number list thing number one. Good antagonists should be physically threatening. I don't think this is all that complicated. Most of them are. I'd say this is the one that most movies get right. If anything, a lot of the times they go overboard on this. But to create tension, it should be believable that at some point your antagonist can kill your protagonist. Take Frank Castle, the Punisher, from season two of Daredevil. He wasn't the villain, but he was definitely an antagonist for a while. He was completely capable of killing Matt. Frank didn't seem to want to, but if he had to, he could. And if Matt got into a fight with Frank, it would be tense because we wouldn't know how that fight was going to go. But then you think about that in terms of the hand. Not only have two main characters completely destroyed the hand in their own series, Matt in Daredevil season two beat up a ton of ninjas and in season one, he lit one of their field generals on fire. And then Danny in the first season of Iron Fist also beat a ton of hand members and apparently killed, but I guess didn't kill, but pretty much killed Bakudo, one of the five fingers of the hand. So right off the bat, we have two characters that are pretty capable of fighting the hand. On top of that, we've got Jessica Jones, who has super strength and is somewhat invulnerable. She spends most of the fight scenes in this movie just tossing hand ninjas around. Doesn't seem to be in much danger. And then there's the worst offender, Luke Cage, a bulletproof, indestructible guy who you could reasonably assume you could put in a room with every single member of the hand, and as long as there was no time limit, he could kill all of them because they don't have any method for stopping him. The one member of the team that potentially could is Sawande, who has some sort of pressure point based martial art that is set up in a way that makes it seem like he's going to be Luke Cage's big problem and he's going to be able to neutralize Luke Cage through the series. And in the fight at the Chinese restaurant, Sawande uses this pressure point technique to knock out Luke Cage and Luke Cage is captured by Sawande and his faction of the hand. But then, off screen, Luke Cage escapes, defeats all of Sawande's goons, defeats Sawande, and then brings him to the Defender's hideout, where his head is promptly cut off by Stick. So none of the villains in this series are really that threatening. We, as an audience, have no indication that our heroes are in any real danger. Especially since these are just ninjas. Like, some of them seem a little stronger than usual, supplemented by magic or chi or energy or something. But, like, you get the feeling that if at the end of this, Frank Castle just rolled up holding that minigun that is teased in all of the promotion for these shows and never appears, I think, I didn't finish Punisher Season 2, he could just kill all of them. Kind of like he does at the end of Daredevil Season 2, so who cares? So we need some antagonists that are physical threats to our heroes for some reason. Next, number two on my numbered list. We need an antagonist that can facilitate interesting action scenes. This is also kind of a no-brainer, and a lot of movies get this right, although otherwise quality movies like Black Panther and Wonder Woman both end with action sequences that aren't bad, but I guess come off as a little underwhelming. And for different reasons, in Black Panther it's just two guys bouncing 
bouncing around scratching each other with essentially identical panther suits. And in Wonder Woman, it's just Ares throwing tanks and lightning and whatever at Diana until she kills him. There's not a lot of creativity in those action sequences. And it doesn't just have to be that the way that your antagonist fights is fun to watch. The antagonist just needs to facilitate interesting action sequences. Think about Kilgrave and Jessica Jones. He's not a physical match for Jessica Jones, but he can mind control characters that would be a physical match for Jessica Jones, like the Luke Cage action sequence. Or he can create scenarios that turn into interesting action sequences. Compare that with the hand. Some have different weapons than others, but almost every fight is the four defenders versus waves of goons, like a beat em up arcade game. Goons show up, the hero punches them or throws them into a wall or something, they fall down, another goon shows up. It's not very fun to watch, and it especially highlights one of the other big problems with the defenders, all of the heroes punch. Luke Cage takes a lot of hits and punches, Jessica Jones is kind of a blunt instrument just tossing guys into walls, and Iron Fist and Daredevil are essentially the same guy. So in an action sequence like this one at the end of the series, it's really hard to tell who's who. They're all doing more or less the same thing, and it gets boring. So we need villains that can create interesting action sequences. And finally, number three on my numbered list, and most importantly, and the thing that Defenders got, I would say, most wrong, there needs to be some sort of ideological difference between your heroes and your villains. Just something that sets them apart. Some clear philosophy that the villains hold and the heroes oppose. And it doesn't have to be as explicit as like the Dark Knight where the heroes are constantly talking about their philosophies and saying my philosophy is that the people in Gotham are good and your philosophy is that they are bad and your philosophy is about chaos and mine is about justice. That doesn't need to happen as explicitly, although like in season one of Daredevil, you can have characters like Fisk and Matt talking about what they believe, how that makes them similar, and how that makes them different. They both want to protect the city, but Matt believes in punishing criminals and not killing people, and Fisk believes that sometimes you have to get your hands dirty and cut off a guy's head with a car door. And this is where the hand really loses it, because season to season, the hand does not seem to have any consistent idea ideology, no belief system, no real consistent goals. The only indication that they're even after all these dragon bones is that at one point we see a big hole. It's not like the characters in season two of Daredevil are constantly talking about how are we going to get to these dragon bones. It seems like something that's set up pretty late in the game. And because these different factions of the hand don't get along, it's impossible to figure out what they even want. What makes them similar besides the fact that the five of them left left Kun Lun at the same time, and the five of them all want to be immortal, and they're all okay with killing people. But since we don't know what the Hand wants, because the Hand doesn't seem to know what the Hand wants, we can't contrast that with what our heroes want to reveal things about our heroes and the conflict itself. So those are my three things. I want believable danger, creative action sequences, and ideological conflict. Those aren't all of the things that an antagonist has to facilitate. There's plenty of others, but I think those are the three areas where the hand fails the most. So to address that, we would need a villain or group of villains that are dangerous for some reason, maybe because of some magical, I don't know, superpowers or weapons or something. And ideally, it would be something that our heroes have not faced yet and beaten. It would be a new thing, a new danger where they have to solve new problems. And with those problems, you would want something that would facilitate creative actions you could so it wouldn't just be problems that you could punch your way out of. Heroes would need to work together in different ways. And to do that, you would just need to not have waves of identical ninjas. Give your villains some personality, define what they can do, what makes them dangerous, and go from there. This one's not all that tricky. However, it would help if your villains were different in interesting ways from each other. And then finally, some sort of ideological difference. And we have to nail down what the villains believe, what they care about, what their goal is how our heroes get in the way of our villains achieving that goal so that the conflict between the two is interesting and natural. And oh, I don't know, since there's four defenders in Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist, it'd probably help if there were four villains. That kind of matchup would be fun because there would be one on four fights where someone like Daredevil has to take these guys on and he's super outmatched, but that forces all four of our heroes to come together so they can stand a chance against these four villains. And I guess ideally you'd 
would want someone from the comics, someone that's fought the Defenders in the past, maybe even ideally a team of villains whose first appearance was in a Defenders comic, and one that probably won't make it into the movies, although maybe they'd fit into one of the Disney Plus shows, but at this point in history, those didn't exist. And wouldn't you know it, there is such a group of villains, and they have not been in any movie or MCU connected TV show to this point. And there are four of them. They are known as the Wrecking Crew. So for a really basic introduction, I would change a little bit of this origin story so that they have more of an interesting ideological difference between the Defenders. The Wrecking Crew are led by a character named the Wrecker. His real name is Dirk Garthwaite. He has an indestructible crowbar that he stole from Loki. He uses it to fight Thor. And originally he was a solo act, but he shares his power with three fellow inmates named Dr. Elliot Franklin, Brian Koleski, and Henry Camp. And the four of them together are known as the Wrecking Crew. They all have some form of super strength and invulnerability. Like I said, Dirk, also known as the Wrecker, has an indestructible magic crowbar that functions kind of like Thor's hammer, although not exactly the same way. Dr. Elliot Franklin is known as Thunderball. He is super strong and has a wrecking ball on a chain that he tosses around. He's awesome. One of my favorite character designs in comics. Koleski is known as Pile Driver. He has big fists and he can punch real good. And then you've got Henry Camp, who is the bulldozer, who is essentially a weaker juggernaut. They rob banks, they are on the Masters of Evil frequently, and they fight guys like Spider-Man and the Defenders. They show up a lot on the cartoons, but they've never been in any of the live action movies so far. I think there's a good chance we'll see them in one of the Disney Plus shows. I think they'd be really good antagonists for She-Hulk specifically, but I really think they would have been perfect for the Defenders. So, the Wrecking Crew. That's my big change. But how would they factor into this story? Why would they have been more successful villains for the series according to the points I've laid out? Why would they be a match for our heroes? How would they facilitate interesting action sequences? What ideological differences would they present? Well, we'll find out in part one of the Defenders Rewrite. Oh, and one more thing. If Bakudo and his awfulness have also made katanas uncool by association, I would highly recommend the documentary In Love with the Samurai Sword. It is a truly fascinating look at the samurai sword through the story of two apprentices and a master sword polisher. I love this documentary. It covers the creation of katanas, the polishing, the selling, the auctions, and even the sword polishing contest. I never quite understood the fascination with katanas. Katanas, but after seeing this, I get it. They're pretty amazing. And you can find In Love with the Samurai Sword and thousands of other documentaries and nonfiction titles on this video's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. You know Curiosity Stream. It was founded by the founder of the Discovery Channel. And on Curiosity Stream, you can watch documentaries and learn about everything from the history of the universe to squirrels. Go check out their catalog. They have something for everyone. And you, that's right, you can go to curiositystream.com Nando for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series and enter the promo code Nando, N-A-N-D-O, when prompted during the signup process and you're membership is free for the first 30 days. I think you're going to dig it. Go give it a shot. As always, I got to thank my patrons. You guys are the best. If you want to see your name up here, get access to videos early, other cool stuff, throw in literally any amount of money at patreon.com slash Nando V movies. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. Also, got to plug my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, where every week me and my co-host DJ pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details Last couple weeks, we've been doing our Dance to Joker series where we look at all of the movies that have featured the Joker in some role. So starting with Batman 66, Batman 89, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, The Dark Knight, Suicide Squad, and the Lego Batman movie, ending with the new Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie. So if you enjoy stuff like that, listen to us. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. We're also on YouTube at the Mostly Nitpicking YouTube channel. It's not... A live stream, but it might be where we live stream videos eventually, but it's just where we upload audio of the podcast in case you prefer to listen to the podcast on YouTube, which a couple people have mentioned they do. Finally, follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash movies. It's where I post updates on videos and podcasts and where I like will talk about some sort of movie news, like when we get 
uh, the image of WandaVision. I'll talk about why I think that looks so cool. Like, I love the Tom King vision run and the idea of obviously not necessarily adapting that, but doing something kind of in that vein. Like, what if 50s sitcom family, but worse, could be super cool. So it's twitter.com slash Movies. That's all I got. I'll see you next time.